Hello, boys and girls. Welcome to my show, Imperfect Murders. I'm your host, Ms. Doe. Today, we are here to remember a sweet young lady named Emma Walker. Probably you know about this case, like high school sweethearts, Emma Walker and Riley Gold story. I really don't know what to say. I think it's better if we start telling about their case. But this case is so, sorry, heartbreaking. And like, I always cry whenever I talk about Emma. So in this video, I will use photos, I will use videos and I will record my voice. You will not see my face a lot in this video. You will, but not like my other videos. Come on, let's start. But before we start, I really don't know if I am able to use those videos and photographs, but I think I am because like I found them on the internet and when something is on the internet, it is kind of like for everyone, right? I really don't know, but if you think I'm doing something wrong, please just comment and say the thing that bothers you. And yeah, that's it. <laughs> I'm really sorry about the voice quality. It's because of I don't have a professional microphone and because of some reason the voice is really really low when I when I record it and if you know why this is happening and if you know a solution please just help me at Central High School in Knoxville Tennessee a Friday night in autumn means a football stadium bathed in lights and two teams battling it out on the gridiron in front of a sea of red and black. Everyone decked out in support of the home team, the Bobcats. On Fridays, everybody is excited at school to see how well we do. It's what our school revolves around, said Seth Armstrong, a recent Central High graduate who played for the team. It's exciting. Out in front of the crowd, the marching band and cheerleaders keep the energy high. And in the fall of 2014, there was a new face on the cheerleading squad. A spirited 14-year-old freshman named Emma Walker. Emma really took cheerleading seriously, said Lauren Hutton, who was a senior on the squad when she met Walker and the two became good friends. She really loved doing it. It was one of her passions. She loved bleeding and she loved football games. She loved just being part of crowd appeal. Early that fall, Walker's moves on the sidelines caught the eye of an older student, number eight. Central High's wide receiver and then junior Riley Gall. Raised by his mother and grandparents, Gall was a top student and loved to play video games. Friends described him as a jokester, not the classic jock type. He was a little nerdy on the side, said Zach Green, one of Walker's friends. A little to himself, from the outside looking in, you'd think he was just a normal guy. When Walker's parents first met Gaul, they said their first impressions of him were positive. Boy next door, her mother Jill Walker said. He came in very polite, very nice in the beginning. He was very likable. I thought he was a very nice looking young man, well mannered, her father Mark Walker added. He would let them have some supervised visitation. He could come over to the house. They would meet up after football games to eat and things like that. Emma Walker's friends said she seemed happy with Gaul in the beginning. Soon, the cheerleader's social media accounts were filled with pictures of a seemingly perfect pair paddle boarding together. 
embracing and taking silly selfies. In one post, Walk wrote, Look how lucky I am. At first, the relationship seemed just kind of normal, said Keegan Lyle, one of Walker's best friends. God, he didn't really talk to us, her friends, a lot, she said. But I was just like, oh, he's shy. It just seemed normal. But then, after a while, was when we got kind of concerned. Friends said they grew concerned because it became apparent to many of them that God didn't want Walker to hang out with anyone but him. He became kind of controlling over her, what she did, her activities, Keegan said. He got more possessive and clingier towards her, and wouldn't let her do certain things, learn who to edit. Over the next two years, Walker and God seemed to become that other classic high school couple the kind that was always breaking up and getting back together. Friends described really dramatic arguments between the two, often over text message or Snapchat posts. Jill Walker said God would always comment on what her daughter wore, telling her what she should and shouldn't wear, to the point where she said she ended up saying something to Emma about it. Then, Lauren Hutton said, things became intense between the couple. She said God started waiting for Walker outside of the supermarket where she worked. He would just wait outside for hours, Hutton said. Lyle said friends told Walker that they didn't like the way God treated her, but she just kind of brushed it off, Lyle said. She did her own thing. According to Walker's friends, God became aggressive, sending her Snapchat messages that said, I hate you, I hate everything about you, and... You're the biggest bitch I've ever come in contact with. One message in particular alarmed Walker's mother. You are dead to me. I'll check the obituary. You, Gaul wrote. We, on one occasion, saw one that said I'll see your name in the obituary, the Walker said. He wrote that to her and we questioned him about it. And he said, I was just angry. And that's when I started to get man many more red flags. Walker's parents decided to ban Gaul from their home and they took away their daughter's cell phone to try to stop the teens from communicating, but it didn't work. Riley gave him an iPod touch and she texted him through the Wi-Fi, Walker's friend Seth Armstrong said. For every nasty message Gaul sent Walker, there was also a quick apology. Emma, I'm sorry for however I act, one message from Gaul said. I love you more than words can describe, said another. Jill Walker said they advised their daughter to break up with Gold several times. But as you do that with a teenager, the more you butt heads, the more she is going to think he isn't right, she said. Because he had a way of isolating her and making her think that he was the only one. By fall 2016, Emma Walker and Riley Gold were still dating. God had graduated and was an 18-year-old freshman at a nearby college by then, and Walker was in her junior year of high school, but their tumultuous relationship had continued despite her parents' attempts to keep them apart. Around Halloween that year, Walker's parents decided to ground her, not allowing her to leave the house except to go to school and cheerleading. They started monitoring everywhere she went and, to their surprise, it seemed to work. She did become like her old self again, her father Mark Walker said. She would come out of her room, eat dinner with us, and socialize with us. Walker had even texted her friend Keegan Lyle to say she and Gold were done for good. She just came to the realization that she deserved better, Lyle said. Then we're all like, yes, finally it's happening. We're like, what have we been waiting for? But God didn't seem to take the breakup well. While in his college dorm room, he swallowed a bunch of Vicodin pills and washed them down with alcohol in, a in an attempt to cope with suicide. His friends witnessed his mood swings. He would be off to the side, moping and saying things like, Oh, I just feel so depressed. I want to hurt myself. Blah, 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 said Gaul's friend Alex McCarthy. Just things that he would just say a lot as a cry for help, I guess, in a way. Then on Friday, November the 18th, 2016, Walker was allowed to attend a gathering at a friend's house. 
Around 11.30 p.m. that night, her friend and classmate Zach Green arrived at the house where they were hang hanging out and Walker pulled him aside. She told him she had been receiving strange text messages from a number she didn't recognize. She's like, Zach, I'm getting these really weird text messages that say, come outside alone if you don't want to see a loved one get hurt, Green said. She showed him her phone, he said. Go to your car with your keys, said one text message. Then go alone, said another. And another said, I've got someone you love. If you don't comply, I will hurt them. Green said that Walker thought it was one of Paul's friends playing a prank on her. But that, she texted back, threatening to call the police. The text messages, however, became more menacing, Green said. If you'd like to hear his crying and screams, give him a call, said one message. Green said Walker started begging him for help until he said eventually she comes out and says, Zach, listen, they said they dropped Riley outside. He and Walker went outside and sure enough, he said they found a body lying face down in a ditch near the house. Under the glow from the street life, he said they could see that it was God. We finally gather him and he is pulling up his head, kind of has his confused face on, Green said. And was like, why are you here? He's like, I don't know what happened. I don't know how I got here. I've been kidnapped. Someone dropped me out there. I don't know what's happening. Where am I? How do I get here? Holding his head like he got hit upside the head, kind of. It was just very weird. Walker was immediately uneasy, Green said, and she didn't really know what to think. She's just like, we just broke up, leave me alone, he said. Seemingly dejected, God walked off down the street alone. He called his friend Noah Welton and told him he had been kidnapped that night, but Welton didn't believe a word of it. He sounded like he had been crying or he was sounding fatigued, I guess, Welton told. 20 out of 20. He basically told me that these people knocked him out, took his car, and threw him in a van, and he didn't know where he was. He said God told him not to call 911 to report the alleged incident. He was just like, no, no cops, no cops, said Welton. Additionally, none of Walker's friends contacted the authorities about the alleged kidnapping that night. The following morning, Walker went home. But then she texted her friend saying a stranger was at her doorstep. I'm home alone and somebody in all black walked down my street and came to my door and rang the doorbell over and over again. Walker texted, adding, I thought I was going to die. She also texted God saying, I hate you, but I need you right now. I'm coming, I'm speeding, just give me a minute. God texted her back. When Walker failed to meet up with her mother that morning as planned, Jill Walker returned to home and found her daughter and God in the front yard. My first thought was, you're kidding me, he knows he's not allowed here, Jill Walker said. So I just get out and ask him to leave politely, and he says, no, I'm here to help, I'm making sure Emma is okay. And he's trying to talk to me, and I just said, you know you're not allowed, you need to leave. And he did leave. Her daughter was visibly shaken and thought it could have been a burglar or maybe even a stalker. Jill, however, wasn't convinced. I said to Emma, don't you find it odd that Riley was involved or appeared at both events? She said no, it wasn't him. Mom, it wasn't him, Jill told 20 out of 20. He's trying to get her attention to talk to him and going way overboard to do that, she added. I was worried and we were watching her, Jill Walker said. On Sunday, we followed her to work, followed her back home to watch and make sure she was safe. By Sunday night, things seemed back to normal at the Walker household. Emma takes it with her friend Keegan Lyle about a homework assignment and went to bed a little after midnight. A little after 6 a.m. on Monday, November the 21st, 2016. Jill Walker went into her daughter's room, but she couldn't wake her up. I said her name, didn't hear anything. Bumped her leg, didn't hear anything, Jill Walker said. And I looked at her face and realized, and checked for a pulse and couldn't find anything. I don't remember a whole lot from that. I know I called 911. I just tried to wake my daughter for school. 
Jill Walker told the 911 operator. She's, she's 16. You said that she's non-responsive? The 911 operator asked her. Yeah. Jill Walker said, sobbing. Police was sent to the Walker house. Knox County Sheriff's deputy Nikki Bulls, the lead forensic technician on the case, said the call originally came in as a possible suicide. When I first got there, I started my photographs on the outside of the residence. I walked in, photographed the interior of the residence, walked into the bedroom, photographed the bedroom, Bull said. There was a hole in the wall, it appeared to be a bullet hole. At that point, I knew that it probably was not a suicide, she added. When Knox County Sheriff's LT Ellen Merritt arrived on the scene, he said he started looking at the outside of the house and noticed a bullet hole in the wall that was about shoulder high. It's just a sm small bullet hole, just, you know, about the size of a ballpoint ink pen, he said. He then located two shell casings outside the home, so he knew two shots had been fired. Walking around outside the home, he eventually found a second bullet hole on a different side of the house at approximately the same height as the first. To an investigator, that tells me that the shoots two shots were more than likely fired by the same suspect, he said. Emma Walker, a beautiful and vibrant cheerleader, had been killed by a gunshot wound to the head after two bullets had been fired into her bedroom from outside the family's single-story home. One bullet had hit her behind her left ear, and the second had logged into her pillow. Once the detective got there, we were asked to leave the residence, Jill Walker said. So obviously it had turned into a crime scene at that point. So they were wrapping tape around our house and walking around outside, but we still had no idea what had happened to her. When police started interviewing Emma Walker's friends and family members that day, Merritt said the same name kept coming up over and over again. Everybody kept giving us the name Riley Gall because of their relationship, because they had seen the way that Riley had treated her and the way he talked to her, Merritt said. Gall took to social media to mourn Walker, posting a series of tweets and a lengthy Facebook post. In one tweet, he wrote, Rest easy now, sweetheart. I love you forever and always. What stood out to me from these tweets immediately was the repetitive nature of him saying, I love you, I love you, I love you, said Madison Kiwi, a reporter at ABC Knoxville affiliate, WATE, who covered the story. Only knowing those posts about him, if you just read that, if you just saw that, you would think that this was an ex-boyfriend who just lost his first love. Walker's friends and family were devastated. The night after her death, they held a candlelight vigil at Central High, and her fellow cheerleaders released balloons in her memory at that week's Bobcats football game. Gosh's friends became concerned with his well-being, so following Emma's death, they told detectives a secret goal had shared with his friend, Alex McCarthy, the day after Gaul's alleged kidnapping. He ended up telling me that he was so fearful for his life that he had stolen his grandfather's gun and he showed it to me. McCarthy relate to 20 out of 20. I was very worried. He reassured me over and over again that he was the farthest thing from suicidal. He was just so scared of these people who were out to get him. Were out to get Emma. But Welton, another friend, also told detectives that Gall had asked him how to get fingerprints off a gun. He said he was asking for his roommate, Welton told 20 out of 20. I told him, obviously not and not to ever ask me anything like that again. And he said, I know, I know, it was for my roommate, I thought it was weird. Detectives brought Gall in for questioning on Monday about his whereabouts during the previous 72 hours. Gall said he thought he had spent Friday night at his friend Noah Welton's house. During his two-hour police interrogation, Gall didn't refer to Emma Walker by name, only calling her the girl. The girl, she texted me. Gall told detectives. Which girl? Merritt said. The one that passed away, Gaul said. When I first met him, I thought he might have been a grieving boyfriend. 
Detective James Hurst told 20 out of 20. When we got into the interview room and sat down, I felt like there was a dark side. He didn't have a whole lot of passion or concern. Gall told detectives he had been trying to speak with Walker that weekend, but she wouldn't engage with him. But she said if I would help her write her paper, she would talk to me, Gall told detectives. And Sunday night, I used one of my friend's phones on campus to call her. Our phone call didn't go very well, he said. She just told me a bunch of cruel stuff and she blocked my friend's number. Afterward, Gold told detectives he went over to his grandparents' house briefly and then drove back to his college. Once there, Gold said he broke down and cried for two, three hours in his car over breaking up with Walker. But as he was describing this in the interrogation room, Merritt said Gold was emotionless. His interview was probably one of the most disconnected. It almost seemed rehearsed, deliberate. Mary told 20 out of 20. At this point, detectives said they knew from McCarthy that Gold had shown his friend his grandfather's gun. Gold's grandfather, who had kept the gun in his car, had reported the 9mm gun, handgun missing prior to Gold being questioned. Detectives asked Gold about the gun, but he, he told them he didn't know where it was. He denied showing it to McCarthy and also denied asking Walton about removing fingerprints from a gun. Then detectives asked to see his cell phone and Gall asked them if he was a suspect. Should you be? The detective responded. But Gall continued to deny having anything to do with Walker's death. When Gall left the sheriff's office, McCarthy said he started getting text messages from him asking why he had told the police about the gun. In text messages, Gall asked his friends not to speak to the police anymore. He was on edge, Welton said. Thinking Gall was lying to authorities, Welton and McCarthy then collaborated with police to help them lay a trap. On Tuesday night, just one day after Walker's murder, detectives wired the two teens up with microphones, a transmitter where police could listen in, and a video camera hidden in a kayfabe and planned out a sting operation to recover the potential murder weapon. Those two young men contacted us and asked if they could help us get what they believed to be the murder weapon back, Mary told 20 out of 20. Obviously, there are concerns for their safety. We went over all that with them and they were still adamant, very adamant that they wanted to do this. They understood the dangers and the concerns, but they wanted to do it. The operation was a success and Gaul was arrested. In addition to the gun, police recovered what they believed to be a treasure trove of evidence, including gloves and bl black clothing, which authorities say point to Gaul also being the man dressed in black who was mysteriously at Walker's door the Saturday morning before she was killed. At his trial in May 2018, Gold's defense attorney argued in court that he had never meant to kill Walker, but had fired a gun to try to scare her and get her attention. He never intended to cause her harm, never intended to cause her death. Wesley Stone, Gold's attorney, told 20 out of 20 exclusively. Consistent with her reaching out to Raleigh regarding the events, Saturday morning. He was attempting to get her to ask him for help again, sort of to be her protector. It's been in his heart. It's been in his mind. It's been in just everything about him. Every day for the rest of his life, wherever that may be, he will have to live with that reality. Stone also said Gold denies being the mysterious man dressed in black. After five hours of deliberation, jurors found Gold now... 19 guilty of first degree murder as well as stalking, theft, reckless endangerment and being in possession of a firearm during a dangerous felony. In the state of Tennessee, a first degree murder conviction carries an automatic life sentence. At his sentencing hearing today, Gold, who did not speak during his trial, apologized to the Walkers for killing their daughter but stuck by his defense that it was an accidental shooting. I'm sorry I took Emma away from you, that I robbed you of the experience of watching your daughter grow up. Gold said in court, What I can do is tell the truth about that night. 
I wanted to scare her. I never meant to take Emma's life again. I'm sorry. With justice served for Emma Walker's death, Jill Walker hopes what happened to her daughter can also serve as a warning to others who may be in tumultuous relationships. If your boyfriend or girlfriend is telling you you can't go there or what to wear or who to hang out with or who to talk to, it's not okay, she said. I think when they become quiet and with their own, it's a big sign too. It's not just bruises, it's emotional and controlling. Since her death, Emma Walker's family has tried to keep her legacy alive. Her mother said she loved animals and wanted to be an ICU nurse, so the family has since gotten a dog park and an ICU patient room at East Tunisia Children's Hospital named after her. It's all things that are a part of Emma and all mean something, said Jill Walker. She added that she also hopes people remember her by being kind to others. <laughs> As a daughter, Mr. Spider. Love you so much. <laughs> well, I don't want you to leave me, but you have to go. <laughs> story and seer so heartbreaking she didn't deserve any of this and i really don't know what to say toxic relationships are not okay gender doesn't matter girlfriend or boyfriend if he or she doesn't respect you or doesn't trust you your relationship makes no sense don't be afraid to speak up. Find your voice and speak up. Tell them. Tell people what you're going through. Ask people for help. Asking for help is okay. It doesn't make you weak at all. It just makes you strong and it just shows people how strong you are and how you are not afraid to speak up for yourself. And that is just so strong for me. Just, just ask for help if you need help. Yes, Riley and Emma was a sweet couple at first. Literally high school sweethearts. But like a cheerleader and a football player like in the movies. But we've all seen the truth and we know that there is always a dark side of the story and... It's just like an iceberg, we're only seeing just a little part of it and the truth is so much different than what we are seeing. The outer look is always different. For example, when you look at Riley, do you see a murderer? I don't. When I look at him, I just see a typical football player who likes to play with girls and who is a heartbreaker generally and who just likes hanging out with cheerleaders but we know that he's a murderer he murdered emma but he doesn't look like a murderer at least to me he doesn't he he looks like a typical teenager or for example emma when you look at her can you guess that she will be murdered one day? No, because when you look at her, you're just seeing a sweet girl, a beautiful girl who has a lovely life, who has friends, who has a sweet boyfriend, but you would never guess she would be murdered. So the outer look doesn't define who you are, doesn't show who you are, or doesn't show how your life is. It doesn't. When you look at yourself, do you see a murderer? Theo? I don't know. When you look at yourself, do you see someone who may be murdered? You may be dead by tomorrow. I may be dead by tomorrow. And I may be murdered, you may be murdered. We really don't know what will happen to us and unfortunately 
it doesn't matter how careful we are because like if we're gonna be murdered then we will just gonna be murdered and <sighs> thinking about it really act actually makes me really really sad and it scares me and you know if i be murdered one day i want i would i want people to tell my story yeah i want people to talk about me i don't want them to forget me and i think you wouldn't too like if you die you would want yet yeah, like oh my god i can't talk you would like people to remember you right that's what i'm doing here remembering people who didn't deserve to die giving voices to those who don't have theirs anymore okay enough about my bullshit i wish emma was still here with us because she was so sweet so caring she was amazing i just hope that her soul rests in peace but i really don't know if she can like <sighs> i don't know emma we love you we wish you were still here with us and we remember you. Thank you for remembering this young lady with me. Have a life full of stars. Till then. <laughs>